Okay. Uh, thanks, Sean. Thanks, uh, MMA Scomos, for inviting us here. <clears throat> so, good evening, my fellow doctors. I'm Dr. Selina, founder of uh, Disruptive Doctors. Uh, so, actually, before we begin, I think I need to, uh, in respect to the organizer, um, I'd like to put out a disclaimer here. I am not here to tell you to quit medicine in any form or another. Um, so firstly, I actually want to stress that I, I actually have the utmost respect for all my colleagues who are still practicing medicine and those who have already became specialists, you know, especially my colleagues who are still serving um, KKM and trying to make a difference because uh, you guys are on this journey or those guys are on this journey that I could not continue, right? But <clears throat> let's just face it that not all of us here are going to become to be able to become a specialist, right? And not all of us here are happy just being service MO, just being stagnant where we are. So when I was a service MO, I actually wasn't very ha happy being stagnant or just being a service MO, right? The, the lack of growth was killing me. And it really is, no, but no one has the right to deny you or anyone of growth, right? So now I want to like stress here that it's not about labels. It's not about us in clinical versus you in non-clinical or leaving medicine at all. It's about opportunities and growth. And if the path that you're on has no more growth potential for you, then you sh should find and move on into another path that has that growth potential for you. You know, but some of you may be happy doing what you are and that's fine, right? But those of you who are not happy with where your career is now, then this webinar, whatever I'm about to share, is for you. And um, in this webinar, I'm going to show you about what healthcare really is all about and how you can find your non-clinical career without going through all the mistakes that I went through. And for those of you who stay to the end, I'm going to give you access to the ebook, an ebook I wrote, uh, which were for doctors like yourself. It was actually written for someone like me uh, many years ago when I was in limbo uh, for doctors who wanted more out of their careers and for those who are thinking about transitioning out of clinical medicine, but you don't know where to start. So um, this is brief. And because of that, right, I actually have to tell you about a bit about disruptive doctors that I'm not here to pull you out of medicine. Um, what we are is actually, um, you know, everyone's afraid of us because they think we are here to pull them out of medicine, but we're not, right? We are actually a platform uh, for doctors on all things healthcare. As you can see, our tagline, empowering doctors, transforming healthcare, right? So um, this sort of focus that we have, which is diverse careers for doctors, health that healthcare, tech and innovation, entrepreneurship, business, investment in healthcare. So some of you may have, um, you know, want to find ways to invest. And then instead of investing into something you do not know of, it's better to invest into healthcare. And we actually have a lot of education on that. And finally, doctor's well-being. So we're actually here to help doctors impact healthcare on a larger scale. And um, we do this by helping doctors become more agile, innovative, tech savvy. It's not about computers or techy stuff. Agility actually means being able to transition, bring all that skills with you and move on into any other sector of your choice. So that's a mindset. It's a mindset thing, right? So before I start, I thought I'd just share a little bit about me. Um, I've always wanted to be a doctor, right? Uh, ever since I was young, I've always wanted to be a doctor. Uh, these were my heroes, people who actually shaped what I thought health medicine and healthcare was all about, right? It, it wasn't, it was not accurate, but these were the people that shaped me. And uh, I graduated from Indonesia. Um, Indonesia was fun. I got to see a lot of the weirdest cases there. Um, I came back. I did my housemanship. Uh, I did my housemanship in Suramban. Uh, I completed my district posting in Sumpang Pertang. It was it was interesting like, being in the middle of nowhere where your town is the size of one shop lot. Um, but it was fun being there. And then 2014, I came back. I was in NS. I uh, was in... Uh, NS and ICU in Suramban. Um, I actually thought I was going to be an intensivist. I really love um, 
like the whole ICU setting, uh, how we actually treat patients. That I, I really love it. Um, but in 2016, I actually had a slip disc. Um, and when I when I had the slip disc, I actually asked my uh, HOD at that time to give me light duty. I, I just wanted some time off um, just working in the clinic instead of being in the ICU. I just needed three months to recuperate instead of, you know, having to do the heavy lifting. But what he told me was I didn't have a future in medicine and that I should leave. So what I did, I left. Um, now, there's something clearly wrong with the story. I mean, one, obviously, there was lack of support for me. But secondly, I played the victim, right? It was very easy to play the victim. I, I, I could have done so many other things to stay in medicine, but I didn't. I used this as an excuse to leave. So the first thing I actually want to share and impart on you guys is that You should always know because, um, you know, the contract system, how they, um, you know, I, I blamed everybody else for me not being able to become a specialist. But the fact was, I was actually very unhappy being where I was. I, I wanted to impact healthcare, but I felt like I wasn't impacting healthcare the way I wanted, but I didn't know how to do it. So it was easier for me to blame somebody that, that's why I didn't become a specialist. But the fact was, I was actually very unhappy at where I was. So, um, so for you out, you guys out there, um, my juniors or maybe my colleagues, own up to what you want. If clinical medicine is not what you want, be brave enough to say this is not what I want and move on. And if clinical medicine is still what you want, but you're still not happy, think of try to. Break down what is it about your situation that you're not happy about. If it's not clinical medicine, is it your environment? Is it uh, because you're not in the department you want? Is it the system? So try to break that down to find out what exactly it is. Right, so um, today I was tasked to talk about getting into non-clinical careers. So here, the, I, I thought I'll just break it down to something simple which you guys can immediately implement uh, to get started if you are thinking about moving into a non-clinical career. So here are the three things that you need to know. Um, however, before we start, I think I need to clarify what clinical and non-clinical means. So clinical basically means it's a patient-facing uh, side of medicine where you actually require your APC because you'll be prescribing, you'll be doing procedures, you'll be consulting patients. So you are required to have your APC. Non-clinical, however, is a non-patient facing part of healthcare. And whether you need an APC or not, it actually very is very dependent on the role that you're, um, you're in and the company that's hiring you. See, some of them may want a medical director with an APC. Some companies may not. So it's very dependent. As a rule of thumb, in a non-clinical sector, you actually do not require an APC. So, um, okay, before I um, before that, I think I need to tell you guys that sick care is not health care. Now, the reason why all of us, myself included at one point of time, felt really stuck and that there is no other opportunities for doctors like us was because we're all trained in sick care, not health care. So I'll just, uh, just some food for thought. If a health patient came to you and saw you in a hospital, what would you do? Well, if a healthy patient came and saw me in the hospital, first, I'll get really pissed off. Uh, then I'll try to settle this patient and send him home and tell him not to come back unless something has happened and then probably bitch about him to my colleagues, right? So if a patient comes, if a healthy patient comes to you, you won't know what to do. And neither did I back then because I wasn't trained in it. So technically we are not healthcare worker, we're more of a sick care worker, right? But if you leave the sick care, if you leave sick care and jump onto the, ban, the healthcare bandwagon, you'll actually see that there's abundance of opportunity out there. So this is actually what healthcare really looks like. Right. So where we are, we've been 
only playing in this field, which is all the sick care that we know of. But there's wellness, prevention, uh, there's all this other kind of medicine, humanitarian medicine, diving medicine, osteo medicine, and this is non-clinical sector of healthcare, which actually all of us would never be exposed to unless we stepped out of it, stepped out of our comfort zone, out of our sick care. Then that's only when you'll actually see this, right? So <clears throat> the question here, um, so here it's not about sick care is better or non-clinical uh, is better. There's no such thing as that. Oh, this whole thing, everyone needs to work in tandem. We all have to pull our weight. Then only this whole thing in healthcare works, right? So right now we think we're pulling all the weight, but we have not seen what these guys are doing, what these guys can be doing, what these guys can be doing. So I, I've heard, heard a lot of specialists saying that, oh, aesthetic medicine is not medicine. So the reason they say that is because they're still playing in this field. No one is seeing what's in here. What is aesthetic medicine? What is wellness? What is prevention? So just to open your scope, this is actually where the opportunity lies, right? But with all this opportunity, the question is not what is out there, but rather how do you choose what's right for you, right? So um, when I was, you know, after I left uh, clinical medicine, I went to IMR. So many people... Um, there were a few people who told me that research is not for everyone, you know, but nobody elaborated. So I didn't know what that means, you know. So I came and jumped right into research uh, without knowing anything about it. You know, I, all I thought was that, oh, yeah, I'm inquisitive. I like asking questions. Maybe research is a good idea and it's something different, right? But research was a huge shock to me. I mean, at least where I went. Okay, I went from saving lives every day to just sitting behind a cubicle, not knowing what I was doing. Um, the place I was in every day, nobody talks to each other, you know, like they were very focused in their work, being in the lab, coming up, typing on their laptop. Nobody says hi. And if I ever talk in, in the office, someone will text me and says that, oh, um, please keep quiet. We're trying to do work here. You know, that, that was like, a shock to me, right? So a part of me died every single day I went to work. I just hated it. I dragged my feet. But you know, some people actually thrive in this kind of environment, but not me because it took me being in the wrong place to realize that I'm actually an extrovert and I need daily interaction. So the second thing you should do is not just follow the crowd, right? Because you know, like, What's hot now for you guys that's thinking about leaving medicine? Uh, thinking of leaving KKM, probably aesthetic, right? Because it's so hot. So you just decide, okay, maybe I just do that. But <clears throat> the thing is, if you don't know who you are, your personality, your strengths, your weaknesses, your interests, you may just be going into something and wasting time and money. So like when I was, just an example, right? When I was in um, IMR, I would always jump at a chance when some when the RA had to go out to see patients because I just needed to talk to someone. Right? I needed to go out there and talk. And when I was there, I saw how they struggled to get consent with patient, from patients. They don't know how to uh, convince the patient to give them samples. So their success rate was like always about 50%. But every time I spoke to the patient, the patient always understand what I need, what I was trying to explain to them uh, what was what we were what we needed from them, and they always, always, almost say yes. So that's when I realized, hey, my strength. I was very good at speaking. I was very good at influencing people, but unfortunately, I was in a position where that strength was not utilized. You know, I wasn't building onto that potential. I was just put into a corner, and that's why I felt so stuck. Right. Um, I felt I was in a dead-end job. I was wasting my days, not utilizing my talents and skills that I, I have. But, and, but then at that time, the thought of leaving KKM was just too scary because I was so comfortable. I was really there for like nine years, 10 years in KKM. You know, I don't know what is out there. I don't even know how to start, right? But I wanted something fulfilling. So 
this is when I realized all the personality. So this is a concept here of understanding yourself. So for me, I'm actually a very, I'm a dominant person. I make decisions quick. I'm not afraid of risk, of conflict. I'm very competitive and I like to set my own rules. So imagine when they set, when I was in IMR, I was forced to stay behind the desk, not voice out my opinion, um, not really doing anything exciting. It was very monotonous. So it did not suit who I am. So here, if you actually understand who you are, where your personality is, it's so much easier for you to find that right role. So I'll give you another example, like uh, aesthetics, right? So we had uh, one of our premium member, I mean, because we've been helping a lot of our premium members get jobs. So there's one, I actually, she she came, she came to us and then she said, I'm going to just do um, aesthetic medicine. So no idea what aesthetic medicine is. She went there, spent a whole year, did her Mac, took some papers, like spend 18k only to realize that is not for her because to become to be in aesthetic medicine you need this skill you need to be this person one who is good at establishing connection one who's able to you know uh be in the spotlight because that's what aesthetic is it is not clients that you're serving uh, not patients you're serving they are clients you're serving but the person that jumped in here she fell in here she was more of this cautious person who likes to plan things, very meticulous. She doesn't, she's not an extrovert. She likes being by herself. So she struggled when she was in aesthetic medicine and it took her one year to say, okay, maybe I cannot go on here. So here's the thing, right? Like I used to think um, understanding yourself, your personality, all this was fluff and BS, but that's actually the core because as I start helping doctors, place doctors in all these positions in companies and all, that's when I realized that actually the employers, they actually really look at this, this whole scope here. This is actually how they decide whether you are a dominant person in this role. Do they need someone who is dominant in this role? Do they need someone who is able to build connection or in this role? Do they need someone who is very good at um, data, who likes to, who's very meticulous, who likes to look at things like all this minor, minor details, right? So for you guys, this is actually very important. There's a lot of uh, free personality tests out there you can just do uh, just to understand, a brief understanding of who you are, what you are. Um, we're actually covering this in our non-clinical Pathfinder workshop. Um, so the bottom line is, if you don't know who you are, you spend so much money, um, you actually end up applying for that same type of job that doesn't suit you. And you keep jumping into something without feeling that fulfillment. It will cost you time. It will cost you weight time and money waste stage. So yeah, so the second thing is you guys can go and find out where your personality is, your strengths and your interests. Now, the last thing that you can do, the third thing, um, this is actually something I learned along the way, uh, is to sharpen your ax, right? So Abraham Lincoln said, give me six hours to chop down a tree and I'll spend the first four hours sharpening the ax. Um, for a long time, I, I've seen this, but I never really understood it. Um, so here's what um, we usually see, right? Because I've been placing doctors, all our premium members, we've been placing them for jobs, like medical director jobs in uh, insurance company. We've been getting them jobs in a pharmaceutical company. And the problem is there'll be a lot of applicants, but a lot of them who want to venture out into this field don't understand that um, there's a skill gap. They have to upskill themselves. They think that just because they have the medical degree, it's a be all and all. And um, you can get any job you want, but that is not the case, right? Um, you have to understand what is the skill gap. So just an, here's a concept that I think uh, you guys should understand. Um, Going through KKM training will, is, is like basically the floor level. That is just to get you into the game. It doesn't mean that you will excel. Okay, so imagine this whole thing. Okay, so um, just uh, I, I just want to take a moment to really appreciate this because I generated this uh, image using AI. I managed to get AI to encapsulate the thought and the image I see in my head. So 
KKM is basically this, right? It is a factory. This here are actually the MOs, housemen. You are actually the product on the conveyor belt. So if you go through a basic training and you come out thinking that you are better than everybody else, it's not true. When you come out, your resume will be exactly the same as the person next to you if you have not done anything extra, right? You. This is exactly what employers have been complaining to us. Like when we've tried to place all these doctors, they'll say that, oh, this resume all look the same. Don't you have anything different? You know, it's so... That's when we saw the skill gap as we were trying to place doctors. That's when we saw this is why doctors find it hard to get into industry jobs because you think that going through KKM is everything, but that is only the floor level. So, And it's even worse now because so many of you are quitting in bulk. You're going to flood the market. And as you flood the market, you're competing with each other. And if a hundred of you only one person does something extra. This is the one person that will be like, they will pick this resume. Everybody else, you're just going to blend in into the background, right? So this is actually what it looks like, right? Also, I generated this uh, using AI. So I'm very proud of this. Um, if you come join us uh, in Disruptive Doctors, we've got tons of this workshop where we actually help you upskill yourself and use tools to bring more to the table. So this is actually where we are right now. Basic HOMO training. This is where you are. This is actually what the industry needs. And this is the skill gap that's here, that no one sees this. So you have to do something more. You have to understand what are the skill gaps that is required for that job that you actually want to apply for. Right. So, yes, you have to spend money on yourself because if you're not going to spend money to upskill yourself, then why should anyone bother to hire you? Why should anyone bother to help you? Right. So even I personally, OK, I resigned and I realized that I enjoy creating something out of nothing. Right. I realized that I found my interest. My interest is just building stuff, creating something out of nothing. So I went through that whole process. So that I showed you, um, and I came to a realization that I love doing this. But so what are the kind of jobs or careers that I can actually get into uh, that fits what I want, right? And that's when I came up with, oh, business is actually something that allows me to build something out of nothing, to create value, to give something back. I always wanted to give back. So I realized that was what I could do. But where I was, I was here. And I needed to get here. So I actually spent thousands, tens and thousands of dollars ringgit on my own learning. So I picked up a lot of courses, like what were my skill gap? I didn't understand what business was. I didn't understand marketing. I didn't understand sales. I didn't understand team building. I didn't understand leadership. So many things I didn't understand. And I went for workshops and workshops after workshops just to build up the skill. So um, those of you who are thinking of jumping over, build that bridge. That bridge... You build, you you bridge the skill gap. I guarantee you, you'll be able to find all the jobs you want on this other side. <clears throat> so here's an action plan, I think, for all of you here listening, what you can actually do. First thing is identify your, person your personality, your strengths, your weaknesses. You can use um, all that free personality tests out there. Secondly, list down what your interests are. So for me, I realized that I enjoy building something out of nothing. I enjoy creating. So you break down to what you actually love doing and then you shortlist all the roles uh, from that career opportunity, the healthcare opportunity um, ocean that I showed you, right? So you shortlist them based on your personality, your strengths, your weaknesses, and then what your interests are. From there, find out what is your skill gap? What do you need to get across? And just, you need to, upskill yourself, no one's going to do this for you. And if you can't do this for you, even I can't place you in jobs. Because for me to help you, you really need to help yourself, right? So um, this, I've been sharing so much and I thought, uh, I, I hope that was helpful for you. I just wanted to share that there is a non-clinical pathfinder workshop that we are organizing this 
and much. So everything that I've shared here earlier today is part of what we will cover there. Um, actually, this is actually the course overview. Um, at the end of the workshop, what you have is a clear plan on what to do next without wasting any time. And the best thing about this is once you have all this uh, knowledge, you can actually repeat it and do it over and over again. So first, we're going to cover on all the non-clinical opportunities in healthcare, like what I showed you earlier, where to find them, how to find them. <clears throat> Here we have that self-assessment tools and technique, like what I just showed you is a design thinking method and how to identify your strengths and your weaknesses. Uh, next, I mean, without a proper goal setting exercise, you're not going to get to where you want to be, right? So before this, I've never had proper goals until I met a mentor. And he taught me how to set goals so that I can achieve what I want because this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. So maybe, you know, you guys who are in clinical, maybe the next three years you may want to be in pharmaceutical, but then after that you realize, no, I want to go into hospital management. So all this are, it, it's, everything is dynamic and it's fluid. So with all this, I actually, you can actually, reset all your goal setting to achieve all the things you want, right? And one of the things I thought, uh, I realized is that what is really tough for most doctors is financial management during that transition period because some of you may have to take a pay cut because when somebody hires you, if you don't have that that, that they need for that job, that means they got to train you, which means they cannot pay you that salary that you want. So, how are you going to manage that? So we're going to talk about financial management. We actually have someone, an expert to come to, to really explain like how you can manage your finances until you hit that paycheck that you want, right? Um, next is building that step transition plan because this is going to be your playbook. And there'll be, we understand there'll be obstacles, challenges. So tips and tricks from me, from Dr. Charles and Dr. Vivek how you can make that transition happen. And as a bonus, actually, we are going to talk about some side income opportunities during that transition as opportunities that we have for gig jobs. And um, we actually have expert panels that will be coming to share how they make that career transition, what were their steps, what steps they took to get to where they are. So Dr. Ashwita is actually a MSL in GSK and Dr. Anthony Stanislaw is a CEO and he used to be the COO of Diagnostic Labs, InnoQuest Diagnostic Labs. And InnoQuest is one of the largest labs in Southeast Asia. So um, this is some of the testimonies I thought I'd just share with you. So this is Dr. Iziani. Um, she came for our workshop last year and she told us that she, everything she set out during that workshop that she planned um, came to fruition, right? And she's she got into all the things that she wanted to do. And um, this is Dr. Xia. Um, he when he realized that the personality test was really helpful because it helped him narrow down his career choices and what was the next move to make, right? So what you're getting in this is going to be a highly curated playbook to get your career, the one you want, um, through a proven design thinking method. Uh, understand yourself, your personality, strengths, opportunities beyond the hospital walls, learn how to manage your finances. Uh, there will be side income opportunity um, and get all your burning questions answered by doctors who have already made that successful career beyond clinical medicine and a supportive uh, support system community. And it's actually 580 for the workshop. However, for MMA members, those who are watching in today, um, I'm actually going to, oh, uh, I think I'll share the link shortly after this. So that if you sign up today, um, there's actually a massive discount. Um, but this is only last. This only lasts till tomorrow. So, um, those of you who are really thinking of transitioning, don't know what to do, or even not transitioning, actually you want to go into other clinical pathways, the one that I showed, this would really help benefit you because you understand who you are, what your strengths are, if this thing that you chose fits you or not. So, um, yeah, so you can connect with me. Uh, you can, we've got tons of uh, materials on YouTube, um, on Instagram and Facebook. You can connect with us. 
So um, yeah, that's all from me, I think. Okay, uh, thank you, Serena. Thank you for sharing this. Uh, well, so actually, uh, I mean, I mean, listening to your presentation, here there are some of the things that I know we have been trying to we've been thinking about. Uh, one of the things actually, well, it was the, when you mentioned skill gap. So we, we noticed that you know, a bunch of us who, I mean, we are all products of the Malaysian healthcare system uh, in the sense that we all have to do a housemanship and then we do a, an O and all these things. Um, and, and one thing that we noticed uh, when, because we are having interview sessions with people for a number of uh, different uh, reasons. Uh, number one is to become permanent position, permanent doctors. Second one is actually for people to go for the exam, uh, not exams, the, the uh, master's program itself. Um, and, and we notice that people, you know, sometimes they have got some difficulties in regards to the interview skills itself. Uh, you would, you would, you would assume that you would assume that um, wearing properly to, uh, you know, to 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 the interview session is common sense or or or, or something that you know people will be aware of. But a lot of people actually um, uh, do not know that this is a requirement by itself. So just wondering, what are the top skills that the market is looking for for anybody who is trying to leave um, clinical medicine and go to somewhere else? I sh it really depends on the jobs that they want to hire, they are uh, applying for, because not all jobs are created equal. So, but I can tell you mindset that they want someone who brings something to the table uh, not someone who comes and say I demand this I should be paid this because I'm a medical doctor they want someone who comes and say hey I can help you do this 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 um, I want to sit at the table because I can help bring you forward that is the kind of people they want people who are here to help push the company forward those are the kind of people that usually gets hired so not the ones that come and say, I demand this because I'm a doctor. I mean, so so if I'm if I'm getting you right, it means you have people who add value to the to the team. And and this adding value to the team, uh like you say, this value comes in different shapes and sizes. So if you are say really good in doing surgery, really good in doing anesthetic uh, work, anesthesiology work, uh, then you'll be uh, adding mean you'll be adding proper value to, to, to you know a surgical team and stuff. But if you were to go out to elsewhere where you need to say you need to be a lecturer, you need to teach, the value that you have to bring is totally different. So if a person is trying to um move to a different industry, then they probably have to pick up these kind of skills elsewhere. Then now the question will be how do people find and how do people develop these kind of skills? Well Definitely going for courses and workshop. Even I develop all my skills through courses and workshop. During this presentation, I went through a course and a workshop teaching how to do public speaking. I went through, um, you know, courses and workshops. That's one way you can actually develop because why do you pay for somebody else's time? Because you want to cut short that time, right? When you pay for somebody's expertise, you're cutting short the time it takes to learn something. Right, so that's one thing. Another thing is, um, it's counterintuitive to take up more more roles and responsibility in your current job. Mm. I mean, yeah, definitely learning from someone is you know getting their years of experience, the years of development that they went through it condense itself and come come to think This is this what this is what you're paying them for. Uh, but of course, um, uh, uh, being really active. Uh, you know, the more you write. The more the, the better your writing skills are, uh, the more you volunteer take on roles in, in your team, you know, organizing events, these are where you develop all your skills from. Yeah, when right. I was in so, KKM, I always try to avoid yeah. extra work, you know, like every one of us we want to try to avoid extra work. Don't look at me, don't tell me, do anything. But you're actually shying away from a lot of opportunities because um there was once when I was given a task and I actually stepped up to it because I thought I'm not doing anything. I may as well do this, right? I just stepped up to it. Um, I had to fly to Sarawak when I was in Arima, I had to fly to Sarawak, Sabah, and I had to go and talk to the stakeholders, finding out what's going on and all that. And I built 
a very valuable skill there, like how to make connections and how to do all this market survey, right? I nobody wanted that 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 um task because they were they were expected to travel and move around and all that. But I thought, okay, I pulled the I mean, I draw the short straw, right? So I had to go with it. So initially I was like upset, but I was glad I actually got that job. It was an extra work on my plate, but I gained a lot more from just doing a little extra. So if you really want to pick up more skill, you definitely have to do more. And and definitely, I mean, um, um, you know, a, a person's a person's uh, value is not just um, is a person's value is not just based on what they can actually carry out in 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 the their yeah, job setting as well. It's also about the things that they carry home, they they bring home, and they you know on the daily interactions with other people. Um, so I'm just wondering, you know, in your experience itself, has anyone come on come on to you and say? Uh, or, or, or in in the in your interactions with the people that you come across, um, what are the main skills that you find are lacking? Oh, plenty actually. Everyone that comes, one they actually do not know what they apply for a job, not knowing what it is. That is mm -hmm. one. The most basic stuff, just to write a resume. I th um that I would say ninety five percent. That is a skill by itself. Ninety five percent of doctors that that um because we help our premium members get jobs, right? So we actually coach them, to clean up their resume, and that's how we help them actually land at least. Because the resume doesn't land you a job. The resume gets your foot in the door to get an interview. So that's how we actually help a lot of our premium members to get jobs. Like first, this writing your resume, how do you sell yourself? Because you really, really need to sell yourself on your resume. Mm. So, 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 I mean, the key point is that selling yourself is a skill, but there are 10 steps to it. And then uh, each of these 10 steps, you know, requires a lot of refinement, requires a lot of uh, um, improvement also. So if you can actually get the, small, the smaller steps done, uh, get it, uh, you know, polish out nicely the overall uh, skills level value that you bring to the team will also in increase. Hmm. So I'm actually still waiting for questions to pop into the chat. Uh, if anyone has got any questions, you know, um, we have got quite a number of attendees in our list. Please don't hesitate to share in the um to to text chat in the text box or to actually share it over here. Um. Let's talk a little bit about um from your experience, where do people you uh where do I mean I mean again again understand that uh, people come in all shapes and sizes and interests you know come in very a lot of different places. But in your experiences, what are the best um or the most um frequent uh place where a person you know, come and seek help from you? Uh, actually want to go towards? Most of the time, they don't know what they want. But that's the <laughs> most common... Uh, scenario. That's the most common thing. Yes, the most common scenario that we get. Um, I, want, I don't like it here. I want to do something mm -hmm. else, but I don't know what. Which is fine because a lot of time, we, we're not... Um, most of, we, we've not been taught to think about what we want most, some of us, I think, like me, I became a doctor because I was influenced by Hollywood. Some of you may become doctors because you were influenced by your parents, uncle, auntie, par um, teachers, because you got all straight A's. So it may not be what you want, right? So you, we will never, we'll never know. So um, finding out what you want, there is a methodological process and step to it. Like how I came to what I want, I went through a design thinking process, a design thinking methodology to get to where I want, what I want to do, finding what suits me. It was a, it's very scientific. It's not just, from, I mean, some of us may know what we want, right? Intuitively. But for those of us who don't know, 
that's what we need to do, right? Go through a process, a step-by-step -step process to come to where you want. Even the name Disruptive Doctor, it didn't come out of thin air. If we went through a design thinking process to come up with this, even what we stand for, what we do, we went through that process. And that's exactly the same process that um, we'll be teaching in the workshop, how to get to where you want, right? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I suppose it's about discovering a person's, you know, uh, just, just getting to know themselves better. Uh, that would provide the person's a better idea of where they want to go towards. And then uh, this is where you can, then it makes easier, it makes things easier to direct them uh, to the path that suits them the best. Do you agree with that? Uh, definitely, but I wouldn't say it's like me. I want to be an intensivist. The last thing I want to do is open up a startup, a business. The last thing I wanted to be was an entrepreneur. I remember telling my colleague once, um, like, I would never do businesses or I would never go through entrepreneurship. It's, it's you know, why, why would anyone do that, right? I was dead set on being an intensivist. So hmm. discovering yourself uh, comes in many ways, I would say. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's that's uh that's a. Uh, I mean, I mean, I mean, that's a that's a that's a way to put it. And then, uh, of course, uh, most important thing is actually for the people who are trying to you know uh see if if like as you mentioned in your presentation, if someone you know finds that they may not be really happy or they they are interested in looking for uh a better fit or something else that may be suitable for them, then uh, perhaps uh you'd be good to consider uh because because we. If, if we limit our options towards certain things and then we don't uh, open our minds or discover other possible opportunities, things may be slightly uh, challenging as well. <laughs> hmm. Okay, well, so uh, there haven't been any questions uh, being asked in the um, groups and in the comment section, but uh, no issues about that. Uh, if there are any people who actually you know, text us, send us questions and stuff, I'll be happy to pass it on to uh, Selena and disruptive doctors. So I think um before we end the session, right, I was just wondering, Selena, do you have any say takeaway messages or any uh things that you want our audience to actually uh bring home? Uh yeah, actually, life is life is like disease is dynamic; it changes. So it's okay if you know once upon a time ago you thought medicine was well for you and then suddenly you want to change, that's fine. So yeah, I just know that it's okay to to make a change and divert. It's not you abandoning medicine. It's not you leaving medicine altogether. It's just looking for other opportunities within healthcare. So um, those of you who are actually struggling, you want to do something but really don't know, just come for our Pathfinder workshop. I assure you, you will find what you need there. It will help you at least get started to moving to where you want. I mean, it's better than being lost for a year. Um, you know, you, you can always make more money, but you cannot make more time. So if you stay lost for a year, you cannot gain that back ever again. So yeah, I guess uh, that's all I like to share with uh, the audience. Right. Uh, so thank thank you, Selena, for your sharing. I mean, I mean, we are most of us here are doctors. So as doctors, you know, it can be a profession. It can be some call it the callings. Some call it you know an occupation. Um, but I think I think our contribution to the society doesn't just end at the hospital at the clinic itself. Uh, but we do actually have got a role to play in many other settings, uh, including universities, including places where people would not associate doctors with, uh, like uh, in the in the corporate world or, or somewhere else. So it's actually a matter of exploring and identifying the avenues where you can be the best version of, of yourself. Uh, the place where you can, you know, shine the brightest, the place where you can actually um, contribute most to the society. So um, so for our listeners here, um, you know, it's completely fine if um, clinical medicine uh, may not turn out to be the best fit for you. Uh, there are options available not just, you know, uh, but you just need to know the right places to look for it. So uh, if you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to 
type it down in the chat and comment section. Uh, we will be happy to pass it on to uh, Selena, but of course, leave your contact details so that we can actually uh, send the replies to you. All right. So if um, there are no other questions, then I think uh, we call it a day. We we'll call it a night. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Selena, for joining us tonight. And so thank you, uh, Wiki, um, for, for running, for facilitating the session. And uh, yeah, we'll see all of you then next time. All right. Thanks, Sean. All right, Vicky. Thanks so much. Okay, I think you can leave. Uh, then, Selena, I'll, I'll call you uh, separately. Okay, sure. All right. Thank you.